Hello, my name is Cliff Reese. I'm a retired state government attorney living here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And this will be a presentation on interacting with New Mexico legislators and staff during the New Mexico regular legislative session. I'm going to focus on the staff of the New Mexico legislature. And I'm reminded that the roles that the staff plays during the session and during the interim uh, period between legislative sessions can be of great assistance to advocates. I spent 25 years as an attorney in the executive branch of New Mexico state government, approximately 23 of those years as an attorney for the New Mexico Department of Health. And during that time, I was active in the legislative process from the executive point of view. I testify, I helped draft bills, worked with my clients on bills that they wanted. I helped draft them in rough form. And I testified as a technical expert before various legislative committees during the session and in the interim between regular sessions. After I retired in 2005, I was offered a job as a committee analyst for the Senate Public Affairs Committee, a job that I held for nine legislative sessions. And then the last four legislative sessions, I've worked for the Senate majority leadership, uh, following bills of the leadership. And I'm about to undertake a new role uh, in the near future that will also keep me involved in the legislative process. So my experience has taught me a great deal about how the staff works, not just because I was the staff, but because before I was staff, I really didn't understand what the staff could do to help me and my clients. So let me tell you a little story. Ten years ago, when now House Speaker Brian Egoff uh, from Santa Fe was elected and attended his freshman legislative orientation in December of 2000. He was interviewed by the Santa Fe New Mexican and he was asked at the conclusion of his orientation what was the biggest surprise that he learned uh, during his orientation. And his response was something that always stuck with me. Speaker Egoff said that the biggest surprise that he learned was the role of legislative staff and how they could support his efforts as a legislator. So the lessons that he learned, no doubt, will apply to advocates as well. So let's begin. There are two types of legislative staff that you need to keep in mind. One is the permanent full-time staff, and the other is what I call seasonal session staff. These are staff who just work during the 30 and 60 day legislative sessions that New Mexico has per our Constitution. Our even-numbered years are 30-day short sessions. Our odd-numbered years are 60-day long sessions. And both sessions are primarily dedicated to enacting a budget and raising the revenues to pay for that budget. But the 30-day sessions are limited to three main areas. One is the bills that have a special message from the governor to have it considered during a 30-day session. The other are revenue and appropriations bills that be, can be considered during a 30-day session. And the third is rarely heard, but it is there and available, and that is to consider veto overrides of bills that were vetoed by the governor during the last regular session. 60-day sessions, anything goes, any legislator can introduce any bill on any subject. So let's talk first about the permanent full-time legislative staff. These are full-time staff who work year-round for the legislature. So there are three legislative agencies where mostly where these staffers work. The first one is the Legislative Council Service. The Legislative Council Service is the bill drafting and research arm for the legislature and they also draft bills on behalf of the executive branch and statewide elected officials. The Legislative Council Service also maintains the Capitol building, which if you've ever visited the state capitol, we call the Roundhouse here in Santa Fe. It's a very beautiful building with a lot of art. I sometimes describe it to my guests and visitors as an art gallery disguised as a state capitol. Now, the bill drafters of the Legislative Council Service may or may not be attorneys. It certainly helps. There are some non-attorneys who are more knowledgeable about areas of law like taxation or education than attorneys are knowledgeable. But during the legislative session, the bill drafters and staff attorneys and the Legislative Council Service are drafting the bills, memorials, joint resolutions, and amendments that are introduced during the session. They usually are not present at committee hearings 
during the session unless they're requested by a bill sponsor to provide technical assistance. And then they read a statement, sort of like the, the Fifth Amendment uh, non-incrimination statement that the drafters are neutral on the bill and they are simply there to assist the sponsor and the committee in answering any technical questions there may be about the bill. So by New Mexico statute, the Legislative Council Service staff, when they draft bills, they are required to keep the bill confidential. Uh, they can only share the contents of the bill beyond the requester of the bill draft uh, if the requester of the bill gives permission to the staffer to work with uh, outside people or persons uh, to uh, assist in the development of the bill. So your involvement as an advocate with the council service would typically need to be based on an authorization in writing from a bill sponsor to allow you to participate in the bill drafting process before the bill is introduced. Of course, once the bill is introduced, the bill is public and is posted on the legislative website. Now, the bills, when they're first drafted, are called discussion drafts, and this is an opportunity for the sponsor to distribute the bill to interested parties to get feedback before the bill is finalized for introduction once the session begins. Bills can also be pre-filed uh, under the rules of the New Mexico legislature, but they aren't referred to committees until the legislature actually convenes starting the third Tuesday of every January, per the New Mexico Constitution. A request to draft a bill or an amendment or a committee substitute for a bill can be done informally, but it must be done in writing. So for instance, a legislator can request a bill draft or an amendment or a committee substitute on the back of a business card of the legislator. And it could even be as informal, and I've had this happen to me uh, years ago, uh, written on the back of a napkin in the uh, in the lounge of the House or Senate chamber and taken, then taken up to the Legislative Council Service to an assigned drafter to open a file to do what the sponsor has asked to be done. And this is a way advocates can help their sponsor by being uh, an extension, basically, uh, as a staffer for that legislator who often don't have any staff assigned to them specifically during a legislative session. So, that is the Legislative Council Service. The second permanent year-round staff are the staff of the Legislative Finance Committee, commonly known as the LFC. These people are typically budget analysts and program evaluators. During the session, the budget analysts in particular uh, are involved with uh, what's called House Bill 2, which every year is typically the General Appropriations Act for the next fiscal year that starts July 1st after the session ends. Now the budget analysts also prepare a document that's very important to know about and to access and read for each bill that's heard in committee. They prepare a document called the Fiscal Impact Report, commonly known as the FIR. And the FIR is publicly posted on the legislative website and is a must read for everyone in the roundhouse who is following bills, including advocates. Now the fiscal impact reports are based on research that the Legislative Finance Committee budget analysts may have already done and also based on analyses done by state agencies at the request of the LFC, Legislative Finance Committee which are returned within 24 hours typically to the Legislative Finance Committee and is posted not on the legislative website for the public to see, but posted on the legislative intranet, which only staff and legislators can see. So a tip for using a staff, which I'll get to in a second, is to gain access to the agency analyses on which the Legislative Finance Committee's Fiscal Impact Reports, FIRs, are based. Now, during the interim between legislative sessions, the Legislative Finance Committee staff monitors executive branch budgets, making sure that the spending being done by the agencies is done in accordance with the General Appropriations Act, and the 
performance uh, evaluators also conduct performance audits of executive branch agencies to see how they're doing. This happens during the interim. And then the staff of the Legislative Finance Committee also staffs the powerful Legislative Finance Committee interim committee, which usually consists of select members of the House Appropriations and Finance Committee, the House Taxation and Revenue Committee, and the Senate Finance Committee, which are permanent committees that only meet during the session. But during the interim, House and Senate members who are involved with the appropriation and taxation process meet monthly and develop the budget uh, for the next fiscal year and also hear the performance evaluations uh, done by the Legislative Finance Committee staff and ask questions of the staffers to help develop information about how well agencies are doing. Now something that's important to remember about the legislative staff is that the legislative leaders, like the Speaker of the House, or the President Pro Tem, or the Senate Majority Floor Leader, are typically the only members of the legislature who have year-round staff assigned to them. Pretty much the rest of the legislators are reliant on these permanent staffers during the interim to help them with research and bill drafting. So the third uh, and less known and perhaps less important unless you're following education bills from the, ad, from the perspective of an advocate, the third permanent committee is called the Legislative Education Study Committee. And as its name implies, they pursue uh, research and uh, initiatives around educational uh, oversight and new educational programs starting from pre-K all the way through higher education through the universities. And the Legislative Education Study Committee, Interim Committee, also meets monthly between legislative sessions. And their members are usually members of the House Education Committee and the Senate Education Committee, who help develop education policy during the interim, which results in legislation introduced in the next regular session. So those are the three permanent year-round committees to remember. The Legislative Council Service, the Legislative Finance Committee, and the Legislative Education Study Committee. So let's move on to the second major group of staffers for the legislature who may be of assistance to you during the session. And this is not well known, but I was one of these people, so I know it pretty well, and I'll give you the inside story of how they can help you. So the second major group are what I call the temporary full-time legislative staff, or the seasonal staff. These are employees, often but not all, are retired state government employees like myself, who are allowed under an exception to the, our retirement law to work for the legislature doing session work, it's called, without having our pensions uh, suspended uh, or, or being punished in any way for doing what's typically called double dipping. But this form of double dipping is allowed by state law and it allows retired state employees like myself to work the 30 or 60 days uh, in addition to receiving our uh, monthly pension from the Public Employer Retirement Association. So let me tell you by category what these temporary full-time seasonal staffers do. So the first group are the office secretaries. The office secretaries are the people who are assigned to individual legislators. In the Senate, where there are 42 senators, each senator gets one secretary assigned to him or her full-time. In the House, where there are 70 members of the House, uh, usually a House members will share, uh, uh, two or more House members will share a secretary. So it's important, especially when you're going to a House uh, office and you're looking for the secretary for a particular legislator, make sure you ask, do you work for representative so-and-so? And they may say, no, I, I don't, that's the person over here to my left. Or they may say, yes, I work for him or her, and I work also for another state representative. So make sure you've got the right office secretary for the legislator that you're looking for. And the secretary's desk is typically near the door of the legislator that he or she works for. 
So get to know the office secretary because they typically know where their legislator is at any given time. Uh, you may need to talk to the legislator. He or she may be a sponsor of your bill. You may need them in committee so that the bill can be heard and you don't know where they are. The secretary, the office secretary, typically will know where that legislator is located or even if they're in the roundhouse at that particular point in time because there are times when legislators need to leave the roundhouse, leave Santa Fe for personal business or, or other uh, types of situations that require them to leave Santa Fe, at least temporarily, during the session. So make sure that you know the name and the phone number for the uh, office secretary, for the legislator who may be sponsoring your bill so that you can get in touch with them as needed. Now, each committee, each permanent standing committee of each house has a committee secretary, not to be confused with the office secretary that I just described. The committee secretary is the individual who prepares the committee's agenda, usually in, co in coordination with the committee chair and the committee analysts for that committee. And I'll talk about the analysts in a minute. The committee secretary is the individual who typically sits next to the committee chair during the committee hearings and calls the roll for roll call votes and records the votes. And, and this is very important, you don't see this, but after the committee meeting is over, after it recesses, the committee secretary takes the file for each of the bills that received a positive recommendation, either a do pass, do pass, or a no recommendation, which is neutral, but it allows the bill to move forward. The committee secretary prepares what's called the committee report. And this committee report is a term of art, and it's very important that you know about this. The committee report reflects what the committee did, what the vote was, and whether any amendments were adopted during the course of the hearing on the bill. The committee secretary prepares this in writing, often with the help of the committee analysts, and then se uh, sends it on to the committee chair to sign. And typically the next day, those committee reports are subject to adoption uh, by the full body of the House or Senate, depending on where the bill was heard and uh, usually by a voice vote during the portion of the floor session called committee reports. The committee reports are read out to the floor and there's typically a voice vote on adopting them. Typically they are adopted. What's important about this step in the process is that until the committee report is adopted by the full House or the full Senate, the bill will not move forward to its next referral, which of course is what you want to achieve as an advocate for a bill. You want your bill to keep moving because if it doesn't get through both houses, by the time that the session adjourns on the 30th or 60th day, then your bill dies and you would need to start all over again during the next regular session. So the committee secretary also typically will keep a list or a, a, a stack of the latest agendas. The agendas often change after they've been posted on the legislative website. The agendas that are posted on the website are typically 24 hours old. They have to be submitted 24 hours in advance for the IT staff of the Legislative Council Service, which maintains the legislative website, to post on uh, overnight on the legislative website. So you want to make sure that you have the latest agenda that may have replaced the one that's posted on the legislative website to make sure your bill, in fact, will be scheduled to be heard if you're going to a hearing later that day. If you have the time and opportunity, make sure that you look at the committee report, particularly if there are any amendments, either verbally that are written down or that are submitted in writing, to make sure that the amendments accurately reflect the amendments that were adopted in the committee. I have seen situations, it's unusual, where the amendments were not properly recorded. And once they're adopted, then that becomes part of the bill. And then you would have to fix it in the next committee uh, or on the floor. And floor amendments are typically not encouraged uh, because anything could happen once something gets uh, amended on the floor. So if you have the opportunity to check on the committee report, do so. They are posted on the legislative website 
for each individual bill and you can see them after they've been adopted but if you have a chance to review them before they've been adopted particularly if there's some complicated amendments that were adopted in committee I would encourage you to take a look at that now each committee that meets during the legislative session also has one or more assistant sergeants at arms in the committee room their job is to maintain order in the committee room to collate the briefing books that are used by each committee member uh, during the hearing. They accept handouts that may be prepared and are asked to be distributed by a sponsor or advocate for a sponsor for a bill. And typically they often do an initial screening of the handouts themselves by taking it to the committee chair and making sure the committee chair approves it to be distributed. They also do things like serve the committee members refreshments upon request and this is something that you may not typically know about. If the committee chair is looking for a sponsor who is not in the room, the committee chair can ask one of the assistant sergeant at arms to find that bill sponsor and bring him or her to the room, so the, to the hearing room, so that bill can be heard during that particular session of the committee. So get to know the assistant sergeant at arms in the room. If you have handouts, you can give those handouts to the assistant sergeant at arms in charge of the room before the hearing begins. Let them know what the bill, uh, what the purpose of the handout is. Your handout, as we've discussed previously, should have the bill number and the year of the session at the top so that it's understood what bill that handout refers to. And handouts, as we discussed briefly, are one pagers, are, are very brief, kept to one page, and is not something that you'd want to read in the committee. You'd want to give it to the committee members so they get the basic points of what you're trying to have them remember and of course to persuade them to support your bill. Now the last area of uh, staff that only serves works during the session are the legislative analysts and there are two types of legislative analysts. One are the majority and minority analysts who are assigned to the permanent committees. They work just for their particular party and, and they are hired by the leaders in both houses. And their job is to attend the committee hearings. They may sit in the audience, so you may not even know that they're there. Uh, if there aren't enough room, uh, if there isn't enough room at the staff table behind the legislators for them to sit. Their job is simply to record what happens in the committee and then if a bill gets through the committee process to the floor, they prepare in a confidential briefing book an analysis for each bill that's going to be debated on the floor that day, for only for the members of their party. Now the other type of analyst is what I did, is a committee analyst. So I was assigned to work for the Senate Public Affairs Committee. I worked for the chair of the committee. And our job, I had one other colleague, our job was to track all the bills that came into the committee using the uh, legislative websites uh, search for bill by location. We would check every morning to see which bills were pending in, in our committee. And then we would do a draft agenda for the next committee meeting that we would present to the committee chair uh, in, in private and get an idea of how many bills and what bills the committee chair want to hear for the next a meeting of that committee. Once that was approved, then the an other a the analysts will often prepare a, a written analysis for the committee members that goes into the briefing book and is used by the committee members along with the fiscal impact reports, the FIRs that I talked about earlier that have a budget focus and are done by the staff members of the uh, Legislative Finance Committee. Now, I believe, my personal opinion, is that the committee analysis is a public document. It is not posted on the legislative website. It is not even posted on the intranet. It simply sits on the hard drive of the computer of the committee analyst who has prepared the committee report. I'm sorry, not the committee report, the committee analysis of that particular bill. You can, though, and I would recommend that you go before the hearing takes place for the bill that you're following and ask the committee analyst for a copy of his or her analysis that will go into the briefing book for the committee members. You can read that to ensure that the analyst understands your bill and has explained it in a fair and accurate way. Uh, there's no committee analyst who is an expert on all the different subjects 
that are the subject of the bills that appear in his or her committee. And so sometimes committee analysts miss the mark and you want to make sure that they understand the bill before the bill is heard. And you can give them your one pager in advance, your handout that I discussed earlier, that could also help the analyst understand your bill. Now typically once the committee analysts have done a draft of the committee analysis for each bill, they will run those drafts by the committee chair for final approval before they're finalized, copied, and put into the briefing books by the assistant sergeant at arms before the hearing takes place. Often this is the only information that committee members have uh, when they are considering a bill. The bill itself, any amendments, the fiscal impact report, and the committee analysis done by the uh, analysts for that particular committee. Now, also, in the committee analysis may change committee by committee, but typically in the ones that I did, the template that I used, the committee analysts are asked to suggest uh, recommended questions that committee members could use if they choose to. So if you get in advance, and I highly recommend that you do, a copy of the committee analysis, take a look at those questions that the committee staff has proposed as possibly being asked by a committee member and make sure that either you or your sponsor has, a has an answer in preparation for possibly being asked those questions. So that brings me to the end of what the committee staffs do, both the year-round staff and the session staff. But let me give you some advocacy tips before I close this portion of the video. The best time to visit with legislators is when they are not in committee or on the floor. Hopefully they'll have office hours, and it may vary, but see if you can make an appointment in advance with the legislator secretary if you want to see a, a legislator. Keep your visits brief and to the point because they're busy and lots of people want to see them. And remember that legislators, understandably, will give priority to their constituents, to the people from their district, uh, in terms of a face-to-face -face meeting, because those are the people, obviously, who could vote for them in the next election, if they're running for re-election. So make an appointment in advance, if at all possible. Some legislators will try to fit you into their schedule. Others may just say hello. Others may tell you there's a better time to come back and see me, and you can arrange that as well. Know where the committee staff is located. Typically, the committee secretary and the committee analysts are physically located near the committee chair, but that's not always the case. That's more true in my experience for the Senate staff than for the House staff. Uh, the committee secretary can provide you with the latest information on the hearing agenda and when the hearing is likely to take place. It's often uncertain, especially if it's a committee that meets after the floor session, because no one other than the floor leader really knows when, or the speaker of the House in the House, knows when the floor session will be recessed so that the members can go to their afternoon committees. Whenever you are dealing with anyone at the legislature, whether it's a legislator or a, or a staffer, leave your business card with the bill number that you are following on, the, on your business card. If the legislator or the committee staffer wants to get back in touch with you, they'll know what bill it is that you are following and that will help them narrow down uh, the, uh, the initial discussion about what bill exactly are you talking about. Remember that legislators and staffers deal literally with thousands of bills, uh, certainly hundreds of bills during any given legislative session. And so if you just say, I'm interested in Senate Bill 25, often a very busy committee uh, staffer, which hears a lot of bills, will probably ask, what is Senate Bill 25 about? But at least make sure you provide the bill number for a staffer to look it up before he or she interacts with you. And so good luck with your advocacy. Uh, being informed is, is the best way to be a good advocate. And remember, the um, courtesy is always utmost at the legislature. When you are speaking with anyone, be accurate, be brief, because people are busy, and be courteous. No matter what you may think of that individual you are speaking with, 
that person could be a future ally, even if they're opposing you on a particular bill that you're following uh, in that moment. So always be accurate, brief, and courteous in all of your communications with anyone at the Roundhouse. So thank you for your attention, and good luck with your advocacy at the Roundhouse and during the interim uh, meetings of the legislature.